So in today's code shorts, I want to talk about jQuery. I've been an ardent jQuery supporter for years and years. Pretty much every website I've built for the last 20 years has used it. But the browsers have caught up with this, and now we can use plain vanilla JavaScript code instead of bringing in the heft of jQuery. So I'd like today to show you some simple ways to change existing jQuery code to using just plain vanilla JavaScript code. Now this may not always be possible. If you're using a number of jQuery plugins, it may be more difficult for you to move away from jQuery. But where you can, I would suggest doing it. Another place that jQuery is often used is with Bootstrap. But I want to just talk about the simple things that we sort of take for granted that jQuery does pretty much every day. So in my JavaScript, I have jQuery enabled on this page, and I have a number of tasks that jQuery is doing for me. It's finding an item and letting me set the text, finding a collection of items, setting the text, etc. And we're going to go one by one here and change these to their equivalents using plain vanilla JavaScript. So before we get started, let's go over the HTML. And I'm going to actually turn off jQuery. And so a lot of the stuff I had working here no longer works. And for now, I'm just going to comment out that ready function. We'll come back and talk about how to re-enable that. But for now, this should be good enough. And let's tackle the first task that you often need. And that is to be able to actually select an element using its ID. So we can use that CSS selector in jQuery to make that happen. We can just replace this with actually document because that's the context of what we're searching. And then we're going to look for query selector. And it takes that same syntax. It's going to take a CSS selector to do it. Once it gets this section, we're going to want to set the text. And of course, these helper jQuery methods doesn't exist because this section is just an element, an HTML element on that page. So instead of text, this is going to be text content to found. As soon as we do that, we can see that immediately work here in the browser. Let's go down one and talk about selecting one or more items. And by selecting a set of classes here, we'll actually see that we have a number of list items with a class of item. And so we want to get this list of items, but we're going to get a collection of them, right? And so we can do that again, document query selector, but we're going to say query selector all. And the difference between query selector and query selector all in this case is query selector will find the first element and return the first element. It won't continue to try to find other ones or throw an error or any of that. Just looking for the first one. Query selector all, of course, is going to return a collection in this case. And if we see this, this is actually a node list of those same elements. So a node list has a for each function on it that we can just pass in a function or even an arrow function. But let's just start with functions. And because this function is going to go through each item in this collection and allow us to do some work, we're going to go ahead and say this is an item, right? And let me go back and just make sure that this is content. And now we can see it found that set of list items and now they have content in them. They're taking that space. So this is a big difference between jQuery because you are used to be able to just calling a single function on the collection returned and having it apply to all items. You notice so far that our syntax is more verbose, but that doesn't mean it's going to run slower or that the total amount of JavaScript is going to be bigger. It really isn't. The next thing that is pretty common is to try to find a set of items within another collection. Now this could be an existing element we have. It could be document or in our case, we're going to look for something called selected inside the items. Now we have a div called items and we're trying to find this one element that says selected, right? And so this is going to be a little different in that first we need to get uh, the items div, let's say, and we'll do that by document dot query selector. And we're going to look for that items. Right, that's an individual object we're getting there. And then we need to say let selected. And since we know it's only one, we can actually use query selector again. But in this case, we're going to say instead of document, because th this query selector is going to search through the whole document, we're going to use this items div and then do query selector on it. Now, the idea here is that this is going to be a search within the context of this div and only that part of the UI. And this is useful because it's going to be more efficient than always searching for the entire document. And so here we have that selected item, assuming we found it, and it's going to be context 
content again. Almost made the same mistake. And now we can see that third item is now being marked selected. We could also do plus equals for the item to go ahead and append it. So we have a lot of control over what we do here. Next thing we'll talk about is event handling. We have this very convenient on method in jQuery, and it's a little bit more verbose, but really not that different. So instead of on, it's going to be add event listener, and the rest of the API is the same. You're still looking for what the name of the event is and some callback that's going to do that. So with a, that saved, could be able to come up here and click on where it says found and get that clicked event actually showing up, right? And so searching for on and replacing this with add event listener is really that simple. Of course, this won't necessarily work unless you've gotten rid of jQuery because it expects that this is going to be an element, not a jQuery object. The next idea here is being able to generate new elements. And so in this case, if we had some structure here, we could just wrap it in jQuery and it would create that object and we could go ahead and append it somewhere like in this new item. So the difference here is we need to be able to have an element. So I'm going to go ahead and say document create element. And I'm just going to give it a div in this case. I could actually have it just create a paragraph if I wanted it, but I'm going to create this as sort of the container for it all. Because remember, this could be something much more complex, much more of a tree of controls, right? And so instead of wrapping this, what we're going to do instead is store this, let's call it a container, right? And we're going to say container.innerHTML equals this new element. Now, when creating this element, it doesn't actually put it anywhere, right? And so this container is created a div, and then inside that div, it's injected whatever the structure of some simple or complex HTML you want. And then all we're going to do then, once we add the other stick, is actually call append container. And now we see this new element is showing up, right? Because we went to the section and we appended it into this section. Append is going to append it after anything else in that container. And so generating HTML from just these HTML fragments is as simple as doing this. There's also support for something called the DOM parser that may be actually faster and wouldn't require some parent element, but it's not as completely supported in every browser. So I usually end up doing this for vanilla. Last thing is I'd like to be able to hide and show this panel or change some properties of this panel using vanilla JavaScript. So, of course, this panel, which is this section here, is just going to be a document.query selector, right? We get that object back. And then we're going to need to do the same thing for the button. So, document.query selector for our, our panel button. Now, we could wire these up against each other, but for now, this will be fine. In fact, instead of needing an instance of the button, we can just, let's put it on its own line, change this to add event listener, right? It's the same syntax as the on. And so by getting this panel and then adding the event listener, we can do it in one step. We don't need to create a local variable unless we need it again. But we are gonna need this panel. And CSS was really convenient for being able to look at this. Instead of this, we're going to actually use style, and style has a dictionary on it. So I can say display. So if the style of the panel's display is already none, what can we do here, right? And I kind of hope you don't do this with style, but it isn't something that doesn't work. So I'm going to show you how this works, and then we'll show you a different pattern, right? And then here we'll say none, right? So it's none, make it block, block, make it none. and that should hide and show it, right? Preferable to this actually is to use add and remove class. So let's comment these out. I'm using Tailwind CSS, so you could have any CSS you add that just does the same display block. And we can do this by just saying panel dot class list remove hidden. 
So in this case, we'll change this to say class list. And remember, class list is important because an element can have one or more classes on it. And so we'll say class list contains none. If one of the classes has none in it, then we can go ahead and remove it. Otherwise, we'll unsurprisingly add it, right? Let's make sure we actually have this as hidden. If the class list contains hidden, remove it. Otherwise, add it, right? And so we get that same behavior, but we're using CSS to do it, which is usually preferable. In fact, we can simplify this whole thing by just doing what we would do in J jQuery, which is panel dot class list dot toggle hidden. This will just do that same thing, right? It'll hide and show and just toggle that back and forth. Much simpler, closer to what we would do in jQuery. So the last thing I want to talk about before we run out of time is this document ready function, right? This is something to ensure that the document is ready to be manipulated in the DOM. And you notice that most of what we did here just worked. And most of that is sort of un a coincidence. We put the page.js at the bottom of our script here and we're running locally. And so we kind of gained the luck that it was happening so fast that it should work. But in practice, instead of using document ready, what we're going to want to do is just come up here and say document.add event listener. And what are we going to listen for? DOM content loaded. And then it's just an event listener, right? So it takes a function and does the work. And if I move this back to the bottom, let me get rid of this. And re-enable that, everything should continue to work and it's guaranteed to be beyond there. But in practice, this can still cause a weird race condition. So instead of adding the listener here, we're gonna do a little trick. And that is we're gonna, at the bottom of our document, let's go ahead and set up this document listener. And all of our code in here, I'm just going to put in a function, and I'll call it setup. By putting in a function, we're also getting it out of the global scope, which of course is the right thing to do. And we could say in here, setup, right? Once it's loaded, this would be the same and at, in essence as putting it in there. But we actually want to do one other thing here, and that is when we run this, we want to see if the document ready state equals loading. So if the ready state is loading, then we do want to actually use this, right? We want to go ahead and have it set up the event listener, else we just can call it immediately. So if the content gets loaded before we get here for some reason, if the reading of the HTML gets read before the parser gets here, we'll go ahead and do the setup immediately. Otherwise, if it's still loading, we'll wire up the event listener, wait for it to be ready, and then call setup. This hasn't nearly been exhaustive. jQuery can do a lot of things for you. And hopefully this has given you some taste of how you can convert this to vanilla JavaScript and be able to finally jettison jQuery from your code, especially for new projects. Hope you've enjoyed this coding short. And of course, my name is Sean Wildermuth. Thanks for watching.